Our Bible reading this morning for Ascension Day is from the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 11. I'll read the first 13 verses, and that's found on page 1,924 in your pew Bibles. Um, Revelation is, I think, a good, a good uh, book to go to for Ascension Day. Why is that? Well, we've, we've talked already about what Ascension Day is, celebrating the fact that Jesus is raised to the right hand of God and is ruling overall creation. Well, Revelation is a book that takes place from the perspective of the throne room of God, right? From the ascended Lord. It's from his perspective. That's where John sees his vision. So all those visions help us to see the world from that perspective. And that's a good thing because most of our life is lived down here. and Down here, things look one way. But from the perspective of the ascended king, the Lord of history, things look a different way. Now, today's sermon will be a little different. Um, Revelation, as you all know, is an extremely dense book, right? It's really dense and difficult. So instead of reading the whole thing, all 13 verses at once, I'm going to go bit by bit. I'll divide the readings up into three bits, and as we go, I'll try to uncover what is being said in each of these readings and what the symbolism means. Um, Revelation is a dense book. That means this is going to be a dense sermon, okay? Just a warning you. You know, when I was little, maybe your mom did the same thing. I didn't always like to eat my vegetables. And so sometimes with her carrots, she'd, you know, she'd stew them up a little bit and put a little butter and brown sugar on them, right? There's no butter or brown sugar on these carrots. <laughs> okay? You have been warned. Let's read. I'm going to read the first two verses only, just the first two verses. I, that's John, was given a reed like a measuring rod, and I was told, go measure the temple of God in its altar with its worshipers. But exclude the outer court, do not measure it, because it's been given to the Gentiles, and they will trample in the holy city for 42 months. This is the word of the Lord. So, we have the first bit of symbolism already in two verses. There's quite a bit in there. You got the symbolism of a temple. You got a symbolism of, a, of John doing some measuring of this temple. And you've got the idea that there's two courts in this temple, and one of the courts is measured, and the other courts isn't. And the one that isn't is trampled. So, what, is, what are we supposed to, what is this saying to us? Well, let's start with the temple. What do we think of when we think of the temple? Uh, first clue. The temple in this passage is not, is not the physical temple in Jerusalem, right? That's probably the first thing that pops into our minds when someone thinks of the temple. That's not this temple. How do we know that? Well, first of all, by the time Revelation was written, that temple had already been, it didn't exist. It had been destroyed by the Romans who came in to Jerusalem around 70 AD. So that temple didn't exist, which pushes against that understanding. And also in the New Testament, when the New Testament talks about the temple of God, what is the most common referent for that temple? It's us. Jesus is the temple and we are part of his body. His body, the body of Christ, we worshipers, built on his foundation, him is the cornerstone, we are the temple of God. And that, that's something you see and hear throughout the New Testament. Just a few examples. 1 Corinthians 3.16 don't you know that you are the temple of God? And you here is pure, plural. So what it's really saying is, don't y'all know that y'all are the temple of God, okay? And the Spirit of God dwells within y'all. We are the temple. 1 Peter 2, 5. You, and plural again, y'all, also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. You're the temple of God. And Ephesians 2 famously talks about the church as a holy temple in the Lord, a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So this temple that we're hearing about, that's us. That's the, the, the people of God. And God gives instructions to John to measure that temple. What does that mean? What does that measurement mean? Now, to understand what that means, you've got to go to the Old Testament. And, and this is a word of an aside for how to interpret Revelation. If you want to understand Revelation, and a lot of people do and a lot of people claim to, 
you've got to know the Old Testament really, really well because the book of Revelation is filled with Old Testament reference. According to Eugene Peterson in one of his books, there are more references to the Old Testament than there are in, in Revelation than there are verses. I'll say that again. There are more references to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation than there are verses. So you've really got to understand the Old Testament to understand the symbolism. That's true of the measuring. What is John doing when he's measuring the temple? You've got to go to Zechariah 2. In Zechariah 2, this is a time in the life of Israel when Jerusalem doesn't have any walls and is kind of in ruins. And God says to one of his angels, go measure Jerusalem. Why does God tell one of his angels to go measure Jerusalem? Because, now I'm quoting, because I myself will be a wall of fire around it. Jerusalem doesn't have a wall at this point. So I myself will be a wall of fire around it and I will be its glory within. I'll be the wall and the temple. So what's the measurement what signify? It signifies God's protection, God's attention and his protection over his people. To be measured is to have God's attention and protection. Uh, think of Matthew 10, where it says, even the hairs of your head are numbered. God even measures the hair of our head. Now, why, why does he do that? It's not because he loves our follicles so much. It's because he loves us. He's counting our hairs as that's a symbol of intense interest in even the smallest things of our life. Protection, that's what the measurement means. We even have an idiomatic expression in English that means the same. But sometimes we say to people, hey, you count. You count. That's not about how tall they are. That's about you matter, right? So that's the symbol of the measurement. But, as you heard, only part of the temple is measured. The inner court is measured the outer court is not measured, and the outer court, because it is not measured and protected, is given over to trampling the Gentiles, and I take this to mean the enemies of God. I don't think this is strictly Jew-Gentile. This is the people who are the enemies of God. They trample that court for 40 months. Now, what's going on here? Okay, if we're the temple, that's people. How can people have an inner and outer court? If this is the temple... How do we have an inner and outer court? What does that mean? Well, to me, that is an honest description of what it feels like to live life in this world. That is an honest description of what life in Christ feels like. Um, we know that we're God's children. We know that we have his protection. But if we're dead honest, we feel like we're getting trampled all the time. We feel like our courts are being trampled. Trampled by death trampled by doubt, trampled by fights in our family or fights in our churches, you name it, there are things that are trampling each and every person here. What this little symbol is proclaiming, what this vision is proclaiming, that while we may feel trampled, it's only our outer courts that the evil one is able to trample. That all of us as individuals and us as a church together, we have an inner court place of protection, a place that has been measured by God. And there is nothing that evil can do to you or to us to trample that place because that place is utterly protected. Do we feel trampled? Do we feel overwhelmed sometimes? Absolutely. But there is this place in us and in you and in me that has been measured by God and evil cannot lay a finger on that place. Cancer cannot touch that place. Whatever your last appointment at the doctor said cannot touch that place. Temptation can't touch it. Addiction can't touch it. Chronic sin can't touch it because it's held by Jesus. So this passage and all those images starts out with this amazing picture of both the reality of, of how hard life is and the promise of how completely we are held by our Lord. Let's go back to the Bible. And I'm going to read, starting at verse 3, I think I'm going to read through the end of 8. Okay, so 3 through 8. God says to John, I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands 
and they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes out of their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have the power to shut up the heavens so it will not rain during the time they are prophesying, and they have the power to turn waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as they want. Now, sorry, now when they've finished their testimony, the beast comes from the abyss and will attack them and overpower them and kill them, and their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. This also is the word of the Lord. Okay, the, the uh, central character of that bit, we've moved on from that promise of the temple, and now we hear about these two witnesses. Who are these two witnesses that are prophesied here? Commentators have a lot of answers. So uh, one of the answers they have is that these two witnesses are Peter and Paul. And they give that answer because of the end of the passage where it talks about their bodies lying in the city because Peter and Paul were both executed by this time. They had both been martyred by this time. Okay? So people say that they're martyred and their bodies in the city. They think, oh, that's Peter and Paul. They're the two witnesses. Others say, no, that's wrong. It's Joshua and Zerubbabel. Who are Joshua and Zerubbabel? You've got to go back to the... Here's where you've got to know your Old Testament. Joshua and Zerubbabel were leaders after the exile when Jerusalem was a ruin and they were trying to rebuild the city and they were facing opposition from within the congregation, they were facing opposition from enemy neighbors and they felt overwhelmed and God came to them and said, no, 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 don't be afraid guys. You are before me like an olive tree and a lampstand. You two guys, you're my olive tree and my lampstand. You're both providing the oil and you're lighting the fire. You're both of those things, so don't be afraid. So people go to Zechariah 4, they know their Old Testament, they say, look, he mentions the lampstand, must be Joshua and Zerubbabel. Still others say, nope, it's got to be Moses and Elijah. And why Moses and Elijah? Well, you heard, uh, Elijah is the one who shut up the heavens from rain in the time of Ahab, and Moses, of course, is the one who's associated with the plagues and turning water into blood. They say, oh no, the two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. So you read the commentaries and it's, it's all these people and you say, no, which of those is it? Well, here's the answer. It's all of them. It's all of them. And here's a clue, another clue about how to read Revelation. Usually, Revelation is not referring to one historical event. Usually, Revelation is referring to repeated patterns that happen throughout the history of God's people that face people who are his children. And that's what's happening here. So the two witnesses are, are all of those guys I just mentioned, and the two witnesses are us. You are the two witnesses. Because just like them, you are called to this task of going out into the world and proclaiming God and saying his glory. And what this passage is telling you, what these images are telling you is that just like Joshua and Zerubbabel and Moses and Elijah and Peter and Paul, when you go out, you will feel small. And the world out there will seem overwhelming in its power and it will oppose you and it will come against you. But don't be afraid because I am with you. You witnesses have the call to go out into the world and witness to today's Ahabs and Pharaohs and those who stand against me. Notice the uniform that we are given for this witness work. It is sackcloth. We do not go out wearing some glittering armor. We're wearing sackcloth. What is that sackcloth about? That's a, um, we wear sackcloth out of humility and repentance. So we do not go to the world in our witness um, in self-righteousness, holier than thou, smugness, rage. We know what's the matter with you people. Nope sackcloth. The clothes of people who know that they are saved by grace and are only standing there because of the grace of Jesus Christ, proclaiming a gospel of grace to people who are no better or no worse than us and who need the same grace. That's the clothes of our witness. What about the weapon of our witness? 
not swords or guns or political power. Our weapon is the gospel we speak. Now you have that little thing in there where it talks about the two witnesses. Fire is going to come out of their mouth and that's how their enemy is going to die. And maybe you think, oh my goodness, this is like we're dragons in some science fiction movie and we're just, and our enemies will melt before us. Sorry. The fire in our mouth is the word of God. The fire in your mouth is the testimony of the word of God, spoken simply, spoken humbly, spoken in sackcloth. You go out, you speak this word, you do his work, and that is the fire that will ultimately judge the world. Think of the book of Acts, Acts 24. In that book, uh, remember that, that story where Paul is brought before the governor Felix? And Paul is in chains, he's a prisoner, and Felix is sitting up on his throne, he's got all his soldiers around him. And Paul, all he does is he stands before Felix and preaches the gospel. He just says, this is what God has done in my life. And you remember Felix's reaction? He's spooked, right? He's, he's afraid, and he sends Paul out of the room because he can't deal with it. The simple word of God, the simple, humble speaking of the truth is what will make God's kingdom come in this world. So verses 3 through 8 remind us that our role as Christians is to go out in the world dressed in humility and with act and indeed embody the work of Christ. So now let's go back one more time and I'm going to start back at verse 7 and read all the way through the end of 13. Now when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes from the abyss will attack them and overpower them and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, and language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. Disgrace. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other's gifts because the two prophets had tormented those who lived on earth. But after three and a half days, the breath of God entered them and they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud as their enemies looked on. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake tenth of the city collapsed, 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. This is also the word of the Lord. So we have the protection, we have the mission. Verses 7 through 13 give us some idea of what we can expect as a result of this mission that we do. And at the beginning of the passage, the results don't sound so good, do they? The witnesses are martyred. They are opposed, they are killed, their bodies lie in the streets. It sounds like we're going to lose and, and the rest of the world, they're gonna give each other high fives and send each other gifts and they will celebrate. But right after a short time, and now I think here's the part of the passage where um, the vision refers to the end times. The witnesses will be raised up. The last judgment, right? When the dead shall be raised. The witnesses will be raised up and stand on their feet. And Jesus will return. And the judgment of the nations will occur. And at that point, when Christ returns, everyone will see that the witnesses that were speaking the truth. And our testimony will be vindicated. And not only will our testimony be vindicated, then I think something deceptively wonderful happens. Let's look at verse 13, right? And you have that prophecy of a severe earthquake and a tenth of the city collapsing and 7,000 people killed. And that sounds pretty harsh, right? That sounds like, wow, that's severe judgment. But you got to put it in perspective. Tenth of the city falls, but 90% of the city and 90% of the people are spared. And then what do they do at the end of verse 13? What do they do after they're spared? They give glory to God. They turn to God. They bow the knee to God. 90% of the people turn and name the Lord. 7,000 people perishing sounds terrible, but it's a tiny number when you think about what could possibly be 
And it's a tiny number when you compare it to the ratios of the Old Testament. Again, again to the Old Testament here. When the Old Testament prophets prophesied judgment, they also had a ratio. Only their ratio was the inverse of this one. Instead of 90% of the people being saved and 10% killed, it was 90% of the people destroyed and only 10% saved. Isaiah 6, 13. The judgment comes and the Lord says, only a tenth will remain in the land. Revelation 11, it's reversed. In Amos 5, verse 3, the prophet says that when the judgment comes, a city of a thousand will only have a hundred and a city of a hundred will only have ten. Only a tenth will remain. Revelation 11, way more hopeful than that. And then you probably all know that in the book of Kings, Elijah laments that there are only 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Only 7,000 righteous remain. But in this case, it's not 7,000 who remain, it's only 7,000 who perish. And all the other people give glory to God. When you read through Revelation 11 quickly, it feels um, dark and difficult. But when you dig in, there's hope, there's protection, there's grace. And there's something for us. Because as I said before, you all feel trampled. You all look very well put together this morning. You look excellent. But I know that you're, you're all trampled, right? There's all things in our life where we feel like we're absolutely overwhelmed. You young people trying to figure out your life. You middle-aged people trying to deal with all the pressures, feeling like imposters because all of a sudden people are putting you in leadership positions and how in heaven's name did I get here? And you retired people, right? Trying to figure out what does it mean to be called by God in retirement? What does my life look like now? We get up every morning trying to get on top of our problems and usually about 10 o'clock our problems feel like they're on top of us. And in this passage, your ascended Lord says to you, you are measured and protected and you are totally in my hands. I give you this work of witness, but don't be afraid, it's not hard. Small words and small actions are like fire in my hand. And by this fire, I will purify this world. By this fire, I will make all things new. So don't give up and don't be afraid. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus, to sp that we could spend a little time in your heavenly courtroom. Ascended Jesus, it was good to hear your word and to see that perspective. Lord, you know all the ways in which we feel overwhelmed. Thank you that we have a picture of your kingdom coming and this protection that you give us. Make us bold, Lord. Make us bold and hopeful in a world which is cynical and empty a lot of times. Make us bold and hopeful um, so that your fire can be lit in this world. Amen.